Okay, uh, hello and welcome to our talk when we're going to tell you about how we applied um, the transformer architecture for a learning to rank uh, problem. So um, we both uh, work in Allegro enhancing uh, machine learning ranking and yeah, here we want to share a story about one of the experiments that we, that we did uh, on, this, on this journey. Okay, let's start by um, introducing what actually learning to rank is. So it is a field of machine learning where we are interested in optimizing a total utility of some list of items for the user. So um, yeah, we need to sort some list of abstract items. It can be text documents, it can be products in, a, in an e-commerce shop so that they um, they are presented in the order that would satisfy the user when 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 he would uh, look at those items. And to make it a to, to put it into a supervised learning regime, we need a data set where we have query, and along with each um, item retrieved for this query, we have a relevance label for for this item. And this item relevance can be expressed either as a graded one or a binary one. In a graded case, we usually have some scale like from one to five for every document. And those data sets are usually created by uh, human annotators. So they are usually clean. And, but on the downside, they are small, expensive, and static. So they, they don't, for example, follow uh, the, uh, the, the things that are going on in the, in the culture, in the in the, for example, product space. For binary relevance, we usually get the labels from, for example, click-through logs from search engine. And although it is not a direct relevance signal, we treat it as a proxy for relevance because users may have clicked some document, not because it was relevant, but because like by pure chance or like going, um, thinking that, well, okay, Google or something showed me this item here, so it is probably relevant, I will take a look. This kind of data is cheap to collect. Uh, we can have lots of them, but it's noisy. Okay, so this is an example of how we collect um, implicit feedback data from uh, search logs. So we collect all the items that were displayed on some, on some search results along with the query, along with who the user was, and uh, we convert the items to some feature vectors and collect actions taken by, by users. So whether it was clicked, skip, maybe purchase, maybe some other action. And most ranking algorithms fall into the category of score and sort type. So we actually don't learn a ranking function as a whole, but we learn a scoring function so that it will assign a numerical score to every item and then we will just sort it in a descending order. And if you cannot think about how this could be done in another way, one example is a sec to slate algorithm, which is an iterative process at, and at each stage, it just points to one of the items that are candidate items and say, okay, this will be on the top. And in the next step, it will just pick the next one from the remaining set. So this, this can be done in a different way, although it is not that common. Okay, if we have a scoring function, it's just like apply it for everything and sort it. Okay, be before we dive how to solve this problem, uh, let's think about the metric. And the usual, the most popular metric for um, evaluating ranking is normalized discounted cumulative gain, um, abbreviated as NDCG. So to kind of dissect this, this metric, let's start from the end, so the gain we get gain from every relevant document that is on the list. Um, uh, it's cumulative because we accumulate the relevances for every document for from starting from the top positions. It's discounted because uh, the, uh, the value of the gain is discounted by the position on, on which this document appears in the final list. And so here you can see on the figure on the right, it's NDCG for a listing. Um, as a function of the position of the only relevant document. So if we would have just one relevant document, the NDCG value would be, uh, would be high only, for, only if this document ends up in a 
in their top positions, top, top few positions. And the CG is usually mm, um, used with a cutoff, so that's it's stated and the CG at five. It means that we just look at top five positions and we don't care about the rest. Uh, the normalized in here is to account for that different listings have different lengths and different number of relevant documents. And if we normalize it by the maximum value of discounted cumulative gain, we get a measure between zero and one for every item list. Okay, so we want to train a model that maximizes this kind of metric. And we would like to do it with a gradient-based optimizer. But this metric relies on a sort operator, so we need to first sort by the scores. And this one is not differentiable. So it's an active area of research to find um, a way to maybe approximate this metric or do some other trick um, to like directly solve this task for, for, for the final metric. But in the meanwhile, all the loss functions that are used are a surrogates for the target metric. So they actually don't guarantee to optimize NDCG. They optimize something else, which is um, or, or proven to, to some extent or experimentally confirmed that it helps in um, increasing ranking metrics as well. So um, in a point-wise settings, we have a loss that is defined for a single item. Think about that like a classification model, whether it was clicked or not. That's, that's just it. That's the simplest case. In a pairwise settings, the loss is defined for pair of items. So we take two items, we like pass them through a shared weights network, for example, and compare their scores. And we, we just want that the scores are in the proper order, but we, we look at pairs at the same time. They are just pairs. And there are list-wise metrics, and one of them is listnet, where we treat, where we treat scores. We convert the scores to the probability distribution of which document will be the top one, and we minimize a cross entropy between uh, this distribution and the distribution of a grant true taken from the grant true labels. So it like takes the whole list at at the same time. It doesn't look at the particular scores of the documents. Okay. Okay, so n now that uh, Tomek has already uh, told you a few things about uh, learning to rank, I'd like to show you the basics of uh, transformer uh, neural architecture that we used in our uh, learning to rank uh, neural model. So, um, uh, transformer is a neural architecture that was first introduced in Attention is All Unit paper uh, in 2017 and has since become the state of the art in NLP in machine translation, for example. Um, the thing that uh, mm, it introduced was processing whole sequence at a time. So you may recall RNNs, LSTMs, and so on. Uh, they have that sequential nature, right? So uh, they are uh, uh, difficult to parallelize. They are slow to train and infer with. They have these recurrent de dependencies. So there's uh, uh, exploding or vanishing gradient problem. A transformer. Uh, while uh, tackling these problems very well. It allows for a contextualized and position aware representation using uh, attention mechanism, which is very important here, and uh, uh, positional embeddings. And transformer as a whole consists of encoder and decoder blocks. We uh, make use only of the encoder block because we aren't, use, we aren't doing this typical sequence to sequence task. We only need to score the items, so uh, encoder uh, is okay here. Okay, so uh, I've told you that uh, attention is key to the transform architecture, right? So it provides the contextual awareness when processing a sequence element. So uh, if we uh, look at the outputs of uh, of transformer, every output position depends on the whole input sequence, and that's what the attention brings here. So um, to look at it. Uh, from a more theoretical side, let Q, K, and V be query key and value matrices. And uh, these are somewhat abstract entities. Uh, these are not your search queries or key value pairs in some dictionaries. They are more abstract matrices, so please do not confuse them with anything else. They can be somehow trans transformed outputs of a neural encoder or somehow transformed features in our data set. That's, uh, uh, that's irrelevant here. So uh, what uh, an attention mechanism does, 
scale dot product attention in particular is that it compares a key that is associated with a particular position in the input sequence. It compares it with queries of all the items in the input sequence, compares uh, using a scale dot product. So we get an exactly n dot product values that we later uh, scale by uh, square root of the, of, uh, the dimensionality of the vectors. We apply softmax, so we get a probability distribution over the, position, uh, of the, over the positions. And later we just multiply the softmax output with the value matrix. So that every output vector depends on the whole input sequence, right? And uh, a generic scale dot product attention actually isn't used in a transformer. A much simpler variant is used here. A self attention. So query key and value matrices in transformer are equal to each other, or maybe linear transformation of the same matrix, of the matrix of input features or uh, or um, output of some previous encoder block. So um, in transformer, actually, we apply different sets of learned linear projections to what goes into uh, the, multi the, the the attention layer. Uh, different sets con uh, consisting of the query uh, transformation matrix, key transformation matrix, and value trans uh, transformation matrix. And we can have quite a lot of uh, these sets to capture different aspects of the input sequences and combine them into some resourceful representation so that maybe one, uh, one set of these matrices tracks the price of the items, maybe another tr tracks uh, the visual aspects, and so on. And uh, the output of these, uh, these particular attention uh, blocks can be concatenated into a multi-head attention output. And uh, the final uh, transformer encoder blocks looks like this. It's, it consists of uh, two parts, a multi-head attention part and a fully connected part. It's very simple. With, uh, the only thing that uh, uh, is uh, maybe... Um, is maybe a little uh, different from uh, from some basic intuition is that it has drop it has a dropout mechanism and uh, uh, and the residual connection and layer norm, but other other than that is just multi-head attention followed by a fully connected layer. Okay, uh, let's uh, now think how to combine uh, both uh, both of these things. So um, now if um, you haven't been familiar with the transformer or the self-attention previously, I can now give you an, like a conceptual example of what, what we get with it. So this is how we apply it for a list of documents. Here we have a list of products in, in some shop. So um, they are passed as an input to the, in, to the set of encoder blocks. And what we get in effect is that after first encoder block, the representation of um, let's say first product here, it's not just transformed this representation. It included um, as well what other items are presented on the same list. So imagine that a book costs, like, costs something and probably to, to let the model um, kind of uh, get a good score for this, uh, for this book, we would like to think whether it was presented along with more expensive books, or maybe along with much cheaper books. So, for example, this is what we what we get from applying self-attention to the list of to the list of products. And we stack a few encoder blocks, and finally we end up with a with a score. And yeah, do like normally do uh, sort sort by the scores. And when training, we use those scores. We apply some loss function on that, and we we train it so that the good items have high scores. Okay, but um, in a real-world environment, um, we we would laugh, but we cannot apply this kind of architecture for like all retrieved items for some query. It can be thousands of them. So what what happens usually is a kind of a cascade ranking where we have multiple stages of ranking. Each one is limiting the number of processed items. So we start with like all of them, then we take like top top n, and then at the end we just take top k, for example, to, to present to the user. This is the quality versus efficiency trade-off here. Yes, we can we can take more, but it will take more time to, to 
to make a prediction that latency will, will, will go up. But unfortunately, in a normal setting, the self-attention is invariant to the order of items. So it doesn't matter if you shuffle them before you pass them to this, to this network. So you kind of cannot use the, the information, the prior that you have that, well, those items were at the top and this one were actually the first. So the, the basic ranker would, would put this item as, at the first position. So to kind of account for that, a positional encoding was introduced together with this architecture where we, um, where we like combine uh, features of, of an item with some vector that is representing a position. It can be either a fixed one, it can be learned, doesn't matter for now. We just, here we just sum, sum them, sum those vectors into one and we kind of have a mixed representation encoding both an item and, e, and its position. The example here covers like words. In our case, it would be uh, products. Uh, this picture comes from the Illustrated Transformer uh, Guide, which is like a great uh, resource for you if you want to like look at, at, by example, how does the transformer work. So we recommend it. Okay, so uh, now you are pretty familiar, I think, uh, with uh, with the transformer, with our model. They are quite simple. So we'll describe all these uh, experimental results uh, that we got uh, during uh, during our project. So uh, let's begin with the data sets. So as Tom said at some point, uh, data sets in learning to rank uh, come in two main flavors. These are there are these. Uh, Mm, data sets that have uh, items relevance graded by experts, and there are these data sets that contain implicit feedback, which is noisy and so on, difficult to work with. Um, so we've got this standard LTR evaluation data set called Web30K. It consists of uh, 30,000 queries from a Bing search engine. It's supplied by Microsoft. Uh, the items uh, relevance was graded by experts, and the relevancies are pretty dense. Uh, definitely not uh, not sparse. Defi there, there are uh, numerous uh, uh, examples of queries where there are like almost every items relevant, at least uh, to some extent. And uh, we've got uh, our own data set, in-house data set, consisting of uh, search logs. There are one million queries now. So uh, we've got this uh, implicit feedback, which is noisy and difficult to work with, but we somehow managed to uh, to get it done here, and the relevancies are binary and sparse. This is uh, especially important because not every loss function will apply here. So uh, before I start um, describing the results, um, let's uh, talk a little bit about the table. Uh, the results uh, for Web30K are, are reported as NDCG at, at fifth position. We compare our self-attentive model with MLPs uh, with a similar number of parameters. I think that uh, in most cases, the number of parameters was actually bigger than in the self-attentive case. Also, we supply results uh, of an XGBoost gradient boosting model. So uh, using any loss, we get uh, better results for the self-attentive model than for the gradient boosting model and, f uh, and, uh, f for, and uh, for the MLPs. Only one MLP is worse that, than the gradient boosting model was also important here. And uh, the another interesting thing about this table is that, well, we've got like seven, uh, s seven different losses here. Some of them have real nice uh, theoretical properties like NDCG loss to post plus. It's a ranked variant. I, would, I won't go into details, but uh, it's proven to be a pretty tight bound uh, of, and of actual uh, non-differentiable NDCG but still uh, a loss that has no actual connection with the NDCG, at least not any explicit connection uh, uh, with the NDCG, performs better, and it's ordinal loss based on a generic ordi ordinal regression task. So this is Web30K, and we've got uh, our search log da logs data set. The results are reported here uh, as NDCG at 60th uh, position improvements over the production ranker. We cannot disclose uh, our production ranker details here, as well as the baseline results. So um, not every loss function applies to binary relevance cases, so there are four uh, loss functions left. 
MLPs no longer surpass XGBoost because it's much more difficult setting, uh, which uh, I think that MLPs cannot really uh, work with here. And weighted rank net variants are versatile and effective. Uh, these are uh, lambda rank and NDC JLS2++. And uh, recall that uh, rank net is a loss function that was first developed in like 2005. And the technology is still very, very effective and is going strong. So OK, these are uh, the results. And the main technical part of our presentation is done now. But uh, we'd also like to show you uh, our latest release, our latest open source release the all rank that we use to uh, prepare all these results. So we provide an open source implementation of our transformer-based model, a whole LTR pipeline ready to work with uh, and a rich set of loss functions on our GitHub account. Uh, the framework is based on PyTorch, so most of you will be familiar with it. And co it comes with a handy getting started guide that will kickstart any LTR project, be it research or commercial one. And uh, we, uh, we share it with you under Apache License 2.0. And you can use all rank in a very, very easy way. The only thing you actually need to supply for, for the basic use case for LTR experiments is a JSON file containing training config and a dataset path. And the dataset needs to be structured in a um, in an libsvm format. So we need to tell the, the framework how many transformer blocks to use, uh, where the data dataset is located, what optimizer to use, and so on. It's also possible, of course, to use the all-rank building blocks in a custom PyTorch pipeline. You may only use, for example, the loss functions, whatever you want. So uh, I strongly encourage you to try all-rank if you ever have some LTR needs. We will surely uh, try to develop, is, uh, develop it uh, as much as possible. Um, but another thing that we're, we're going to do in the nearest future is that we'll bring our neural models into production. Uh, and while our work is this research site, we'll also conduct some, uh, some experiments ranging from LTR theory to uh, novel data approaches. There are some, uh, some fields in uh, LTR that are especially interesting right now. So this is uh, NDCG optimization by bound versus direct approximation via approximate uh, uh, sorting operators. There is a multimodal ranking where we can use, for example, the raw image data or raw uh, sound data to recommend, for example, um, music tracks or, or something like that. And there's ranking diversity. It's especially important because, uh, well, we want to satisfy every customer, not, your, not only your average customer. So we need to supply diverse rankings that will satisfy a broader range of preferences. So that's all. And uh, thank you very much. Also, this paper uh, wouldn't have happened, uh, this, uh, this work wouldn't have happened uh, if not for the amazing team behind it, consisting of uh, these people. And thank you for your attention, hopefully not self-attention unless you're transformers. Thank you for your talk. And now questions. Very nice results, uh, congratulations. Can you explain what are the features that are input to this model? Yes, uh, certainly. Uh, well, it depends on the data set. Uh, the Web30K data set contains, uh, I don't remember exactly, but like almost a hundred or maybe so features that mostly come like they are like aggregated values of like TFIDF for this document weighted by something. They are quite, uh, they are described, but they, they are not, uh, not, not raw. They, it's, they, there was a lot of feature engineering done then, there. And for our in-house uh, data set, we like, cannot enclose uh, everything, but those are uh, like the things that we can collect about, about the offers. How, how are they clicked? How good is their, I don't know, photo? How uh, good is the quality of the, of the seller? Um, yeah, so like there are numerical features, and there are like a couple of them, not, not that many. Um, next question. Uh, 
Uh, hello, thank you for the talk. Uh, and I have a question. I guess you compared your transformer model with MLP. And uh, cor correct me if I'm wrong, but you compared it just with uh, normal fully connected uh, network, yes? Yes. So uh, I'm not very familiar with the ranking models, but uh, is there any other architectures based on neural nets, like more advanced and using more uh, novel architectures like CNN, for example? Because uh, uh, you compare transformer with very uh, weak and general uh, fully connected uh, network. Uh, okay, uh, I, I see your point. Um, well, I think that here it's it's like uh, the choose of of uh, feed forward network was um, just due to the fact that we process numerical features. Uh, of course, those uh, the transformer would be applicable to uh, like uh, text or images data if we provide a proper encoder, for example, based on the convolutional uh, network or, or some other for, for, for text or, the, or this. But it's uh, not about the ranking as a task uh, that would require this architecture. It's more about the, the data that you process that uh, like forces you to use convolution uh, or, or RNN. There are uh, models that um, use RNNs here. Uh, one of them is the sec to slate but they don't uh, give very great results and they are quite hard to train. But it's like more focus on what data we process, not uh, the ranking task. Okay, an another question. Is it hard to implement uh, the algorithm for unseen data, for unseen user? Do you need to retrain the model? Um, no, we don't need to retrain the model, uh, but it would as well depend on how would you represent a particular user. In, in those experiments, the user was no like a single entity anywhere in the model, so it was user agnostic. It was a general model. It was not personalized. If you would like to personalize it, you need to somehow account for that, but still uh, there is nothing that requires you to, to do it in the way that you would need to retrain it for for every uh, for, for for the next user. Okay, we got a question. Hi, can you estimate what is the business value? What is the business impact of the new model on for Allegro in general? Well, uh, a tough question. Um, Let's say that uh, it is a model that will like um, work in the wild for uh, like uh, ranking and queries that will be to come. So we don't know w w what they are. But what is usually done? We the evaluation that you showed is uh, based on a kind of it's called off policy evaluation. So we take the historical interactions and we kind of simulate. Okay, what would happen if we would apply this model to the data? Is that how we get these improvements, uh, etc.? And like previous experiments with other uh, models proved to us that they, uh, the offline simulation results uh, are correlated with online results. So what happens if we really deploy this model? And as well, we showed some correlation of like this metric that we want to optimize with some more business oriented metrics like you know conversion etc but you know th that's a thing that we cannot go into like digits thanks okay maybe one more question okay so thank you once again <laughs>